It's Friday night in October of 1993. And in Northern California, three junior high school girls are having a slumber party. Halloween is around the corner, and the girls have been trying on different costumes in preparation for the upcoming holiday. Within seconds, their lives will change forever. It's every parent's worst nightmare. What horror could compare to a child's kidnapping, especially when she's taken from her own home? In 1993, 12-year-old Polly Class was abducted from her room while her terrified friends looked on. The crime took less than 10 minutes. It shocked the nation and forever changed the way child abductions are handled. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. The FBI and other law enforcement agencies were battling against the odds. We had witnesses, and we had a community that banded together to find Polly. But even with the FBI's top flight capability, abductions by strangers are among the hottest cases to solve. Only one third of them have a happy ending. October 1st. Polly Class and Jillian Pelham were waiting for another friend outside of Polly's house in Petaluma, California. It was around 8.30 when Kate McLean and her mother showed up. The three girls were ready for fun. It was Friday night. There was ice cream in the fridge and they were going to stay up all night long. This was going to be a party. No one had any idea of the danger that lurked so close by. The girls kept to Polly's bedroom, but they couldn't suppress the noise as easily. At about 9.45, Polly's mother, Eve Nickel, looked in on the girls and asked them to keep it down. She was suffering a migraine headache and thought she'd turn in early. Eve's bedroom was right across the hall from the girls, and although she had chided them about the noise, she was pretty sure it would only take a few minutes for the 12-year-olds to get noisy again. Before going to bed, Eve took her prescription pills to block out all distractions and get her fast to sleep. The party continued on for almost an hour before the nightmare began. It was around 10.30 when the intruder entered the room. At first, Kate and Jillian thought it was a joke. Then they saw the knife. He told them if they screamed, he'd slit their throats. Immediately, he tied them up and started asking questions. He wanted to know which girl lived there and who else was in the house. Polly spoke up. The girls were terrified and crying. And he assured them that he wasn't going to hurt anyone, that he was only there for money. But when Polly told him where some cash was hidden in a jewelry box, he made no attempt to find it. He gagged the girls and took the cases off some pillows to use as hoods.
He made Polly get up and told the others to count to a thousand. By the time they were done, he said she'd be back. Then he took Polly class and disappeared into the night. Petaluma police officers were called to the scene after the girls managed to free themselves and wake Polly's mother. They responded in minutes. Investigators entered Polly's room and began to look around. The bedroom was in disarray and told of the events that had happened just minutes before. On the floor were binding materials, cut strips of cloth. The cords from the Nintendo game had been cut, and a strap that was clipped from a purse lay on the floor. Pillowcases were strewn about. I know. What Petaluma police detective Mike Meese saw wasn't encouraging. I remember standing at the doorway to Polly's room and looking at these few bags of evidence that we had been able to collect and thinking that that was just such a pitiful amount. And I looked down at the rug and I talked to, to my partner, Larry Pelton, and said, let's take the rug. And he said, why? And I said, I don't know why, but let's just take the rug. We just don't have enough evidence. FBI. Police were in desperate need of assistance. Fortunately, help was on the way. After being contacted by the class family, the Federal Bureau of Investigation offered its expertise. How about, uh, have you all talked to the mother? Yes. Uh, Shortly after midnight, the FBI appeared at the house of Polly Class. Typically, the Bureau handles kidnappings, and with 800 a year to investigate, they have plenty of experience. Because he was familiar with the community and experienced in kidnapping cases, Special Agent Ed Fryer became the lead investigator. But he knew something about this case was different. It uh, had all the earmarks of a stranger abduction case because the statements from the two girls were consistent. Stranger abduction cases are the, are, are the hardest cases to solve, in my experience, because, again, there's no connection between the perpetrator of the crime and your victim or the victim's family, or somebody even associated to the, to the victim. It's a, a, a random act. Surprisingly, a vast majority of kidnappings involved disgruntled family members. And though Polly's parents were separated, her father, Mark Class, was immediately cleared of any responsibility. Abductions involving total strangers are exceedingly rare and leave little for investigators to go on. In this case, however, there were witnesses. Was his hair long or short? A police sketch artist was called in from the San Rafael Police Department. For two hours, Jillian and Kate tried to recall the face of the man who had barged into the bedroom. The girls were still terribly upset, but they managed to give the artist a pretty good description. Authorities now had their first idea of what the stranger looked like. Nose and mouth. After 4 a.m., the girls were taken to the police station, and the FBI called in one of its special forces, the evidence response team. Tony Maxwell leads the crew. In looking at cases across the United States, we have found that when somebody is kidnapped, especially a young child, that they will generally be harmed within the first 24 hours, and probably within the first couple of days could even be killed. So time is of the essence. In that kind of work, the investigator needs to move quickly. The evidence response team is designed to provide forensic resources at a major crime scene. Their sole responsibility is to collect evidence. And they use the most sophisticated collecting equipment available to do it. An electrostatic dust print machine collects tiny hairs and fibers off the floor when a positive charge is passed over a sheet of mylar. Any loose debris clings to the mylar and is sent to a lab for careful inspection. Oh, 
Although the police department had already dusted for fingerprints, they had come up with nothing particularly promising. But they didn't have access to the same equipment as the FBI. The alternate light source was a new method that employed a unique fluorescent powder, which when combined with a distinct ultraviolet light and amber-colored goggles, could illuminate many things that otherwise would remain hidden. The team found four dozen fingerprints the police were unable to see using conventional equipment. But even those were of no use. They were attributed to family and friends. After hours of meticulous searching, something finally turned up. A palm print that at the outset seemed like the first real piece of forensic evidence left behind at the scene. That palm print was found on the bed, on a crossbar of a, um, uh, of a bed, where he apparently put his hand up for just a second to lean on it, perhaps to support himself as he was grabbing something. And with the alternate light source and the fluorescent fingerprint work that we did, we were able to see it, collect it, and then gather that for the laboratory. At that time, the FBI's fingerprint database, APHIS, didn't contain palm prints, only fingerprints. But even a palm print won't catch a suspect. It will only identify one once he's captured. FBI Special Agent Mark Mershon explains. People often uh, think that when you have a fingerprint or a palm print that you quickly, uh, you know, quickly uh, establish the identity of a criminal. The truth of the matter is, in, in most instances, you have to identify a suspect, have fingerprints for that suspect in order to compare with a latent fingerprint. The hunt for the suspect prompted authorities to cover Polly's neighborhood inch by inch. By dawn, more than 100 agents and officers had begun a 24-hour search for Polly and her abductor. Helicopters and bloodhounds had been called out, and an all-points bulletin was issued by local authorities and the FBI. Systematically, the authorities searched every house in the neighborhood. Agents went to Polly's school to talk with teachers and students in the hopes that somebody might have some useful information. Investigators canvassed the neighborhood in pairs, asking if anyone had seen anything suspicious that night. One by one, they interviewed all of Polly's neighbors. Several people recalled seeing a stranger around the neighborhood that fit the description given by the girls. Thomas Georges and his friends were on their way to the video store at around nine o'clock that night when he noticed a stranger standing in the shadows in front of Polly's house. Thomas knew everyone in his neighborhood, but he had never seen this man before. Returning home a few minutes later, the boys saw that the stranger was still there. The description Thomas gave to the authorities matched the suspect they were looking for. Sean Bush was playing video games with some friends who lived in a small rental cottage directly behind Polly's house. It was about 10.30 when Sean happened to glance out the window. He was surprised to see a strange man on the back porch of Polly's house. He appeared to be going for the back door. His description of the man also fit that of the suspect. There were others who saw the suspicious man that night, but unfortunately, none of them alerted the authorities. As Petaluma Police Chief Patrick Parks explains, time was working against them. 
In stranger abduction cases of small children, there is no more critical ta factor than time. Time is absolutely of the essence. And for that reason, you have to get out as many resources you can. You have to put out the word as far as white and white as you can. You have to involve as many agencies you, as you can, get them focused, get their efforts channeled, and hopefully, hopefully, bring about a successful resolution. While officers continued to comb the neighborhood, FBI investigators began executing the standard operating procedure in cases like these. After eliminating family and friends as suspects, they focused on ex-cons who were registered as sexual offenders throughout Sonoma County. Gradually, they branched out to surrounding counties, carefully questioning and investigating each registrant. But nothing turned up. This is a hard case to believe that it even happened. There are three girls that are, that are in a slumber party. They're playing games in their bedroom, in their home, in a typical community, in a typical city. And somebody can walk into your home, the sanctity of the home, the security of your home, and take your daughter is... Uh, if it wasn't impossible, it was inconceivable. The following day, the search for Polly Class had escalated into the largest manhunt in the nation. A massive community volunteer network was formed to assist authorities. While hundreds of citizens searched, others passed out flyers, trying to cover the entire city as quickly as possible. Back at the FBI's Trace Evidence Lab in Washington, D.C., forensic expert Chris Allen was carefully surveying the items collected from Polly's house. I noticed that in untying the pieces of bindings, the, the uh, thin nylon strips of bindings that were used to tie up Polly's girlfriends, that they had jagged edges to them. And I was able to line them up perfectly so that I was able to determine that these all came from one piece of cloth originally, and it was a piece of cloth like a, a lady's nightgown or a, a slip material. Other pieces of evidence found in Polly's room were not so easy to classify. Tiny fibers collected with the electrostatic dust print machine proved to be a challenge to identify. After painstaking examination and comparison, Allen concluded that they had come from the interior carpet of an automobile. Eliminating the cars that could be accounted for at Polly's house, Allen suspected that these carpet fibers were most likely from the kidnapper's car. One more item Allen found was a little more personal to the suspect. I found in the vacuuming of the area rug that was in Polly's bedroom that she was playing on with her girlfriends, uh, a dark brown forcibly removed head hair. And I say forcibly removed because it had a three or four millimeter uh, root sheet on it, actually skin material that comes out of the scalp when the hair is forcibly pulled or yanked out. If Polly had pulled a hair out of the suspect's head, it was evident that she didn't go without a struggle. But even a hair with DNA evidence couldn't bring investigators any closer to finding a suspect. The palm print lifted from the bedpost was sent to Michael J. Smith, a fingerprint specialist with the FBI. Examining the print under laser light, Smith determined that the print had enough ridge detail to photograph. But the light emitted from the laser turned the print orange, and Smith needed to capture a black print on a white background. He instructed the photographer to reverse the color so that the finished print would appear the way it would on a fingerprint card. Now the print was indelible and could be filed until a suspect was apprehended. Investigators had unearthed some solid evidence, but it wasn't enough. Time was running out, and Polly Class was still out there, somewhere.
48 hours after the abduction of Polly Klass, her father, Mark, got a call. Polly? It sounded like Polly. She told her father that she was in a hotel room somewhere and that her abductor had stepped out for a moment. Tell me where you are. Polly! Then the line went dead. It offered the first glimmer of hope. But unfortunately, since Mark's line wasn't set up for a trace, Fryer, all please. authorities could do was wait for another call. Word of the abduction spread rapidly. In two days, 50,000 flyers had been distributed. Community volunteers quickly organized a search command center to work in tandem with the police and FBI. It was an unprecedented grassroots effort. A telephone bank was manned 24 hours a day to field calls and tips. A copy of every lead that was phoned in was shared with the FBI and Petaluma police. Before long, the search center had screened 60,000 calls. Out of those, authorities were compelled to follow up on over 12,000 leads. Processing that amount of data would have been virtually impossible without help from an FBI computer processor. The FBI just happened to have the rapid start team. It was a relatively new concept with the FBI where on a high, uh, an investigation with a high volume of information, we would computerize that information, uh, essentially triage the, uh, the value of the investigative leads and make the assignments and track the, uh, uh, the progress. Even with so many leads, there was one in particular that investigators were anxious to follow up on. When Mark Klass received the first call, the FBI was powerless to do anything about it. The second time she called, they were ready. Hello. Like the previous call, it sounded like Polly, Hello, you, and she could only talk for a short time before she had to hang up. Where are you? But it was long enough for authorities to make a trace. Polly. The FBI had traced the call to a house 30 miles away. There hadn't been enough time to collect an army of agents. The job would have to be handled by a few. something wasn't right. This was just a normal family home. There was no sign of Polly or her abductor. A terrible realization dawned on the agents. When they sat down with one of the girls in the house, she confessed to making the calls. She admitted that friends from school had dared her to call and impersonate Polly. The entire incident had been a cruel joke. This was the, the only indication we had after a week's time that uh, Polly just might be uh, alive still, and we all were poised and hopeful that this would yield a solution and her safe recovery. Of course, it didn't. In mid-October, Kate and Jillian were brought in to give another description of the man who tied them up. A highly acclaimed forensic artist was flown in to make a second sketch. It was pretty well cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The artist was known for relaxing witnesses enough to coax an accurate description from them. The girls were less stressed than they had been that night and were able to give her more to work with. No, they were, they the were second fine. sketch was much more precise. This sketch looked like a person. 
New flyers were distributed immediately. There was no time to waste. But if you look back at true stranger abductions, we have this rule of thirds. The children who are abducted, typically one third are recovered alive, one third are recovered dead, and one third are simply never heard from ever again. That's what we faced in this particular investigation. And that, uh, I think, was one of our uh, motivations uh, to keep the sustained effort up. After a reward had been offered for Polly's return, authorities received a call demanding a $10,000 ransom. They traced the call to a Petaluma apartment building. This time, a SWAT team showed up in force. They were not going to take any chances. Once again, authorities and the family had been fooled. Twenty-year-old James Hurd was arrested for attempted extortion and posing as a kidnapper. It was a crushing blow for everyone. Uh, it became very frustrating. It was certainly distracting towards the main thrust of the investigation, but you had to deal with it. There was no way around it. You could not ignore those things. And it, it certainly chewed up a lot of time and resource. The family had been especially discouraged. A letter Polly's parents wrote to the kidnapper was published in the October 17th San Francisco Examiner. Whoever you are, wherever you are, Please return Polly to her family. She belongs here. We miss Polly so much. We miss the twinkle in her eye and her sweet humor. We long to see her beautiful smile and hear her musical voice. They also addressed Polly. Our darling, if you can read this, please know that your mommy and daddy love you so much and we will continue to search for you until we can hold you safely in our loving arms again. I don't think I ever lost hope as I had Numerous contacts with Mark Class, with Eve, with members of the family. And that was a question posed to me many times. And my response was, no, we have not lost hope. We will not lose hope. Across the country, people wanted to see Polly brought home. Banners sprang up and Americans began a candlelight vigil. Thousands donned ribbons of lavender, Polly's favorite color, to show their support of the search. We conducted searches uh, during the day, during the night. We had a 24-hour operation going. Uh, we conducted searches uh, sunny days, on foggy days, rainy days, uh, rainy nights. Whenever the information came in, we reacted to that uh, because in a case like this, physical evidence is crucial. The search never stopped. The Navy and search and rescue experts joined the thousands of volunteers who were constantly looking. Police and volunteer task forces worked tirelessly. But it would be nearly two months before anything broke. November 28th, 1993. It was two months after Polly Class was kidnapped that authorities got their first real lead. In Sonoma County, a sheriff's deputy was called out to the house of Dana Jaffe. It sat at the end of a long, winding drive off Pythian Road. Dana had been out inspecting her property when she noticed something unusual and thought it might be of use to investigators. She led the deputy through a densely wooded area to a clearing just a few yards from the long winding drive to her house. Scattered in the woods were a few items that seemed somewhat suspicious. There was a large piece of silk cloth that had been fashioned into what appeared to be a hood. A couple of strips of packing tape were on the ground. Yeah, 
A pair of young girls' tights had been tied into a knot, and human hair was entangled in the knot. Other debris surrounded the area. Then Dana recalled the night she'd caught a trespasser on her property not far from where they stood. It was nearly two months before. It all started when Dana's babysitter, Shannon Lynch, had left Dana's house and was making her way back down the long driveway. A man was walking down the middle of the private drive. His stranded pinto was off to the side. He said that he was stuck and insisted that she get out of her car and help. He also wanted to know what was up the drive. But Shannon immediately sensed something wasn't right. She'd later describe him as looking like a wild man. She drove on, leaving him there, determined to get to a phone. Shannon found a payphone about two miles down the road and hurried to call her friend. She was anxious to get a hold of Dana and warn her of the scary man trespassing on her land. Dana didn't waste any time. She grabbed her daughter and a baseball bat and took off down the hill. She saw the car, like Shannon had said, but the strange man was nowhere in sight. She continued down into town and called the police. A few minutes after midnight, two Sonoma County Sheriff's deputies showed up. Dana explained that she didn't really want the intruder arrested for trespassing. She just wanted him off her property. The deputies found the trespasser a little agitated. There was alcohol on his breath, and he was sweating profusely. There were bits of leaves and brush in his hair, as if he'd been rolling around on the ground. He told them that he'd been out sightseeing when he realized that he was on private property. When he tried to turn around, he got his car stuck on the side of the drive. He blurted out that he'd been under the car trying to free it, but the deputies didn't believe it. The way his car was trapped, there wasn't enough room for a person to get underneath. The deputies administered some roadside sobriety tests, but he passed them all. Looking in his car, they found some cans of beer in a plastic bag and a small duffel bag in the back seat. When they asked him if he'd been drinking, he actually opened a beer and began to drink it. They immediately made him pour it out and then told him they wanted to pat him down. He became extremely upset. To make him comply, the deputies told him they would be within their rights to run him in on trespassing. After he'd heard this, he calmed down considerably. They searched him carefully and continued questioning him, but could find nothing incriminating. He was just odd. The deputies remained suspicious, but when they ran his license, it checked out. His driving record was clean, and he had passed the sobriety tests. They had held him for about 45 minutes already, and they had no legal means to detain him any further. There was nothing left to do but pull his car out and send him on his way. That had been two months ago, the same night that Polly Class had been abducted. A hood, bindings, a young girl's pair of tights. It was too much of a coincidence. Putting it all together, the deputy quickly put a call in to the Petaluma Police Department. Within an hour, Detective Mike Meese and Agent Ed Fryer arrived to check it out. I'll never forget the scene. It was uh, late at night then. Uh, by this time, Mike Meese and I are, are standing up on the hillside there on Pythian on the road. It was beginning to get a little misty and foggy, and the rain started to come down. And uh, we looked at each other, and we knew. We knew in our hearts that we had 
basically uncovered a very critical crime scene that this was going to lead us to the res resolution of this case. After the evidence was collected, investigators immediately began searching the Pythian Road site for any signs of Polly. We spent days searching the mountain with over 300 volunteers. I believe we had 25 to 30 search dogs, and uh, we conducted extensive ground uh, searches for Polly, uh, believing that she was still alive, which was the premise that we were working on. As the search commenced, everything began to snowball. Authorities checked with the Sonoma County Police to get the full report of the incident that happened on Dana Jaffe's property. The man deputies had questioned was Richard Allen Davis. Accessing his criminal record revealed he had recently been paroled from an eight-year sentence for kidnapping. What we learned about Davis initially was uh, 1976, he had been arrested for uh, robbery and kidnapping and uh, assault with intent to commit rape. We learned in uh, 1978, he had been arrested uh, for another kidnapping, as well as a couple of counts of assault with a deadly weapon. 1984, he'd been arrested for a kidnapping case, uh, assault with a deadly weapon, including the use of a firearm and armed robbery. You start reading these reports and realize, you know, hey, this guy's a bad actor. This is, a, this is an individual certainly more than capable of being involved in a crime like this. The arrest photo on file matched the girl's description. His mother lived in Petaluma, giving him reason to have been there. The pieces were falling into place. The items discovered near Pythian Road were immediately flown to forensic specialist Chris Allen in Washington. Of the most interest was a strip of cloth that was found in the woods. Allen was quickly able to confirm what detectives had suspected. Essentially what we're trying to do is establish whether or not the cut edges would line up or match. The middle strips uh, represent the fabric that was found at Polly's bedroom, which were used to bind uh, Polly's girlfriends. <clears throat> Subsequently, on the second submission, we received the cloth that was found at the Pythian Road site. These all fit together like a puzzle uh, with the uh, edges and the, and the pieces of fabric matching up end to end. The strips meant more than likely Polly Class had been out at Dana Jaffe's after her abduction. Without a doubt, Richard Allen Davis had been there too. Though it wasn't enough to arrest Davis for kidnapping, detectives felt if they could just get him in custody, they could quickly gather the evidence they needed to tie him to Polly's disappearance. Everything else fell away and we focused on what we had with Mr. Davis, what happened out there at Pythian Road, and what we were going to do next. When investigators discovered Davis had an outstanding warrant for breaking parole and DUI, they decided to bring him in. But he wasn't at home when they arrived. Then a deputy sheriff who was securing a perimeter around the area stopped a van. At the wheel was Richard Allen Davis. When the deputy realized who he had, he calmly called it in to the investigators back at the house. Is there a problem, officer? No, sir. Just sit tight, okay? Authorities reported to the scene, and Detective Meese approached the van and asked Davis to step out. Step out of the van? He informed him that he was under arrest for violation of his parole. No. I'm Detective Meese. I'm arresting you for One thing I think is important to understand how Richard Allen Davis was taken in custody, because it was such a low-key event, and because Mike Meese... Uh, went ahead and handcuffed him. He did it in a very professional way. And he started a rapport going with Richard Allen Davis that later was very useful uh, in bringing resolution to the case. 
It had been two months since Kate and Jillian had seen the man who took Polly class, but they had no trouble picking him out of a lineup. Number one, step forward, please. Even without the beard, his was a face they could never forget. Number one, step back, please. Though he'd been arrested for parole violation, Davis was questioned about the kidnapping. He vehemently denied any involvement, but authorities let Davis know that if he wanted to talk, the door was open. So I took Davis into the hallway and I told him, I said, hey, look, what you need to know is, is we've got all the physical evidence it takes to make this case. And all you're looking at is a kidnapping right now. So if you want to talk about it, you gotta let me know. And uh, he made a noncommittal response, didn't want to talk. And uh, I remember patting my pockets looking for a business card. Didn't have a business card with me. And I said, you know, I'm going to leave my name and number with those guys, meaning the correctional deputies. And if you ever want to talk about it, you know, give me a call. Back at the FBI latent fingerprint lab, Mike Smith was comparing the palm print found in Polly's bedroom with one that had been taken from Davis since his arrest. This was a crucial piece of evidence. Matching the two prints would undoubtedly link Davis to the abduction. After careful examination, the results were called in to Agent Fryer. I, I just got a call from FBI laboratory. They matched Davis's palm print to a palm print taken off of Polly's bedroom, uh, or her bedpost. Um, it was, again, one of those moments where I... There's butterflies in my stomach. Uh, again, realized that this was really very powerful evidence. So I hung up the phone, and again, there was a lot of noise and commotion in the command post. I stood up and I asked everybody, can I have your attention, please? Can I have quiet for a moment? I said, <clears throat> we just got confirmation from our laboratory that we've matched this palm print uh, taken from the bedroom to Davis. We can place him in the bedroom. And it was just a huge cheer from everybody. Papers were flying. Uh, it was just great news to everybody. This is it. It's concrete. He was in her bedroom. We can prove it. We had him nailed down. Though news of the matching print had gone public, Davis was being held in isolation and had not heard anything about it. Then one day, a friend of his showed up for a visit. He urged Davis to talk to authorities and tell them where Polly was. But Davis continued to deny responsibility. Then his friend gave him the news the rest of the nation had already heard. It came as a complete surprise. Davis realized it was going to be impossible to explain how his palm print got in Polly's bedroom. There was only one thing he could do. In Davis's mind, he's now got to do something, and that is try to make whatever deal he can make with the authorities because we, we know that, it, that he was in Polly's bedroom. We can put him there. While on his way to the massive search for Polly near Pythian Road, Detective Meese was paged to call the jail. This was the moment everyone had been waiting for and Meese was anxious about what he might find out. Yeah. After this wait, you know, Davis comes on the phone, and I recognize the voice. And I, so I know it's him, and I said, uh, he says to me, he says, hey, I, I screwed up, I, sc I screwed up big time. Detective Meese and Special Agent Larry Taylor met with Davis in the interrogation room, where Davis related the details of the night of October 1st. Though he was living in something like a halfway house, he had applied for an overnight pass to go visit his mother in Petaluma. Unable to find her house, he had a few beards and walked the streets of Polly's neighborhood. At one point, he was stopped by a man who wanted to sell him some marijuana. He decided to go ahead and buy the joint. In Davis's own words, he got really buzzed and went to the store for more beer. 
he soon found himself wandering the neighborhood aimlessly. He wasn't sure where he was or what he was doing. But Davis had come to the neighborhood prepared. He brought a bag packed with bindings and tape. Forensic experts were able to determine that he had cut the strips with a pair of scissors, a fact which implies intent. Then Davis said he randomly picked a house on the street and crawled into an open window. He remembered hearing TV voices and said he may have picked up a knife from the kitchen. He said he didn't remember anything after that. He claimed the next thing he knew he was driving in his car and was surprised to find a young girl sitting next to him. She was complaining that her hands were tingling. According to Davis, he adjusted the straps for her and drove around wondering what he had done and what he should do next. Then he drove off the side of the road and got the car stuck. Once he realized he was stuck for good, he says he got Polly out of the car and carried her up a steep embankment about 30 yards away. Get out of the car! He planned to leave her in the darkness until he could figure out a way to free the car. The rest of Davis's story about what happened at Pythian Road matched the witnesses' accounts. At the time of the incident, the bulletin about Polly's abduction was just going out over police radios. But the deputies were tuned to a different frequency and would not have heard it even if they had been in their cars. They ran his license, but the equipment they had at that time was only able to give a cursory printout of Davis' driving record. It couldn't generate his criminal record. They found nothing they could hold him on. Davis recalled how the deputies pulled his car out and escorted him to the main highway. But he claims that he waited for 15 or 30 minutes and returned to the site to find Polly. Then he just drove around. At some point, he realized he had to get rid of her. At long last, authorities had found out what they'd been desperate to know. Polly Class was dead. And Richard Allen Davis was the man responsible. Davis agreed to take them to the site in a deserted area of Cloverdale where he had left the body. It was night, but inspectors felt the need to confirm Davis's story couldn't wait until daybreak. He led them to a field near an abandoned lumber mill. Out in the field, under some boards, investigators found the body of Polly Class. It was, a, it was an odd feeling. Uh, you're in the presence of somebody like Davis, and just a few yards away is, is what's left of a very beautiful, innocent 12-year-old. The Polly Class case was special because people cared because the whole community stepped forward and said, this is the last child you're going to take, and that this is our child, and that we are going to go out and look for her until we find her. The case wouldn't come to trial until 1996. But after 10 weeks in the courtroom, a jury found Davis guilty on 10 counts, including kidnapping, robbery, burglary, murder, and attempting to commit a lewd act on a child. The latter charge Davis continued to deny during the entire trial. 
Investigators strongly believe that despite Davis's testimony, Polly was already dead at the time deputies helped him with his car. He was sentenced to death and continues to sit on death row at San Quentin Prison. Polly Class left behind a legacy to save other lives. The way missing persons cases are handled has changed forever since the investigation. Law enforcement databases are linked to different agencies providing vital information to multiple jurisdictions. Missing persons bulletins are now sent out over all police channels. At routine pullovers and traffic stops, officers can access not only driving histories, but criminal records as well. Implementation of the three strikes you're out legislation was a direct result of the case as was the push to expedite the appeals process in murder cases. And a foundation established in Polly's name aids the search for missing children. Involvement of the FBI uh, was critical to bringing resolution to this case. Had they not come in and gotten involved early on, uh, it's doubtful we would ever have had resolution, or certainly that it would have been as, as quickly as it was, even though it seemed like a long time. The unique partnership that was formed between local police and the FBI set a precedent that continues to this day. <laughs>